Welcome everyone to the Directed IRA webinar. I'm Matt Sorensen joined by Aaron Halderman, the great and powerful, Ooh. great and powerful Aaron Halderman. And uh, this is a special Directed IRA podcast episode as well. And guys, you are in for a treat. We have Josh McCallan on. Um, Josh has done some podcasts. He and I have been on <laughs> together. I've been on his, he's been on ours before. And or maybe this is your first time over here, Josh. It is my first time on your show, on your Directed IRA webinar. Okay. All welcome, right. Welcome. Welcome. Well, you guys are in for a treat. Um, I've always enjoyed every conversation I have with Josh. He's very smart and he's typing right now. So, um, funny story. Maybe, on maybe that. go on mute Matt, when you're doing that. Matt, Matt loves that. typing. Yeah. Aaron does it. Aaron does it. And I like kick him under the table. Done. I cannot, I cannot Done. focus with that. And like, can you mute your typing? And then Tristan over here is like, I'm in the recording. I'm like, you're gonna have to edit that out. And he, and he will hate you. He'll be like, you just ruined my, my day. But, so Matt will do another intro here in a minute. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm just, we'll, yeah. we'll re-intro the intro. But this is no way to treat a guest, Josh. So let me, um, let me come back. I'm going to intro you here in a second. But um, attorney Matt has to come out for a mm. moment and give everyone a disclaimer. So just keep in mind. Today's presentation is meant to be educational in nature, doesn't constitute financial advice, not, you know, legal or tax advice. And remember, go seek out professionals when conducting actual transactions, nor is it because, you know, Josh is doing a lot of stuff. Um, you know, if you want to talk to him or get to know him or he even has deals and investment mm -hmm. stuff, I don't know. Do that if you want. It's not meant to be any endorsement or that. I just, we just want to get his knowledge here for everyone to benefit from, including us. So, um, well, we appreciate attorney Matt. So. Yeah. Yeah. We can send him home now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's kind of a buzzkill. He's, like, he's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> you go to a party and he's just like, can't do that. Can't do that. <laughs> Are you of age? No, definitely um, not a yes, man. Yeah, <laughs> nope. Nope. <laughs> um, okay. Well, um, Josh, let me, let me intro mm -hmm. you here. And, um, I like you to to pick, tell people a little bit about you, but Josh has a podcast, Capital Hacking Podcast. Um, he's been investing in distressed assets for quite a bit of time. I don't know what you define that and lots of different things, but cool things too, like wineries and golf courses, you know, he's just not buying the meth lab, you know, fixing blip property down the street, you know, <laughs> he's maybe on occasion. <laughs> I just mean, sprinkle one in there i don't know <laughs> you guys are the best <laughs> so i don't know it's called diversification josh that's right that's right well he's got a well diversified portfolio <laughs> okay well josh, why don't you let why don't you tell everybody a little about you and um and then we're going to turn it over to josh to just kind of get in i told him feel free to go into lecture mode aaron and i will interrupt some questions mm -hmm. we'll do some q a so but um so if you do have questions particularly for josh um throw those in in the q a um, and then, uh, but Josh, tell us a bit about yourself. So it's an honor to be here. I, uh, hope, hope you can see, I'm in one of our beautiful hotel rooms. It's a suite. Uh, that's cool. It, it's one of the things we do. We build the, the nicest hotels on the East coast for our purpose. Yeah. Uh, my quick background, I do have a few slides on it. Is it terrible to just pull up a slide right now and I'll run through it? And I'll Go for it. Do it. Yeah. Do it. All right. Buddies. It. Uh, this way for those who are on the YouTube rate, if you're on the, the drive, I always say, if you're driving your Tesla, we will get through mm. and we will speak to it. But for those who are watching, it's a big honor to be here, Matt, because I, I pulled up slide two, which is all of our times we've been together on the big airwaves at Capital oh, Hacking. I even put QR codes. Oh, yeah. You and I, I think you and I have done it twice, 156 plus 214 yeah. and 146 with Mark. So we've had a great time. Oh, we'll yeah, have to definitely. update Mark's headshot because he's got like this long curly hair now so he's, he looks he's, a, lot he's, more, yeah, he's, he's he, a lot more distinguished he's, he's a lot more distinguished he's due he's due for a new episode with you josh i would love it that last time i was on with mark uh he and i joked about how i had a friend who owned a, a great stand-up comedian uh what one of those stages in manhattan and he's like if you could get me in there i'm coming all the way to, to Cal east coast yeah, uh, over the last Dozen plus years I've been, uh, I switched my career and went deep into hospitality. Um, and over the last five years, I've been blessed by uh, attracting hundreds and hundreds of investors, actually well over 300 accredited investors. And they've allowed me and helped us create this wonderful bio. And the bio includes us running uh, our second major resort business and hospitality business with hundreds of people, uh, major projects, hundreds of millions of dollars invested. And uh, it's an honor. Um, 
But it all starts at home for me. I'm a father of 10 kids, uh, which I think I'm the first one on your show with 10 kids, believe it or not, right? I imagine. All natural, by the way. My poor, my poor wife had to bear all those children. Um, and we live out near Philadelphia. We do projects that look like this. This is our little snapshot of what we've done. And I'll use this as, quote, unquote, a credibility builder so we can get Love into it. the world nice. of distressed, okay. distressed investment. Uh, what we have only, I've only ever bought distress. So I think I'm set up, we are set up for a runway here into the next economy. Uh, you can see on the left, I built a business for a family office and a brand. And we took everything, what, multiple times growth from purchase to uh, to appraisal. And now we've done it three times for investors where we've done resorts. Uh, mostly, I like to focus on resorts because until the modern day, distress in my business in hospitality didn't necessarily mean the economy was going to hell. It just meant a, a property was run to hell. Sure. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a good today. Distinction. Yeah, yeah. Today, there's a new distinction coming, right? I mean, the economy might run a few properties into the ground, and we have an answer for that. Uh, we want to pose a few ideas. Uh, I'm sitting in the property in the dead middle. I'm in one of those windows. If you want to see, I'm in Kent Island, outside of Annapolis, 200 acre resort with water front of a mile and a half. Beautiful. And what? Here's what we figured out years ago, and this is. Again, the pivot point on why we think distressed assets are uh, a really important part of people's portfolio, maybe a section of people's portfolio, is uh, we use something called arbitrage to make them worth more, right? Mm -hmm. And in, in, uh, up until now, the arbitrage for us meant we take a distressed hotel or resort and we overlay new business models. Uh, on the East Coast, we're one of the best in, at uh, uh, wedding operations. Mm. Yeah. And you can imagine what happens when you take a cherry television ready uh, stage like what we have with our properties and you put a mega wedding business into it. It just supercharges. The that's profit. awesome. So that's been the arbitrage we've been doing today. I want to be a I want to be a student with you guys and listen to your questions. But to me, I was joking around. I'm like, this is what you and I originally thought of when we thought of distressed assets. It's like an image yeah. <laughs> uh, vision board, you know, houses falling down. What can we do to make them worth more? And for what I'm going to suggest is this is still the part of the distressed economy and maybe more assets like this will come on board where it's actually plighted and people are going to try to turn them around and add value. Mm -hmm. um, I call this type of arbitrage for today's conversation form arbitrage of form. So you're taking something that is in the right market, but it has bad form and okay. it has not, it has lost its functionality. Um, so you update the property, you do a flip, which is the classic model of distressed asset and you can create value. Now, I think there's going to be a ton of distressed commercial real estate. Mm. You know, I Googled it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, we could go into why I think the economy has shifted and people are going to either be stuck with bad loans and they're going to have to sell at a discount or uh, those times when it's time to do more capital investment, they may not want to. Uh, exactly. This is kind of where I started with the most recent major project we did was this winery. And uh, when you come up on that, you can see that needed a form improvement. It needed to become a modern winery. That winery we bought out of bankruptcy in this picture called Renault Winery. Uh, with with wonderful investors has now grown from a four mil five million dollar purchase in a few years to almost a forty million dollar wow. value in just four years because we changed its function and now you have a bigger wine collection too yeah yeah you know what's great I don't know about you guys you guys probably love IRAs uh, I love wine but I'm actually more of an investor guy yeah so just because <laughs> it's I actually feel bad I'm not as good at wine as you probably are. But uh, I hire great people. You know, there is a Roth wine, by the way. There is a oh, Roth yeah. winery right. called that's the right. Roth Estate. Um, it's a wine, so um, I don't have to. I don't have to send you send you a bottle. Are you, um, yeah, maybe it's a little competitive to your business. It's illegal. Yeah, maybe to send, I don't know. <laughs> Let but me ask it, a um, question, though. I want to get back to this go back. distress because um, you're right. You, I think. How are you going to make money? And I think mm, someone right. with their IRA or you or someone investing in a deal and like distress type opportunities, I kind of like I'm just I'm just like unpacking some of your comments here. I just think really helpful. Um, 
see, you're, you're, you're taking a strategy to these properties, you know, where you're like, if I can put a wedding business into this, I can take the hotel and the catering and the food, and I can bring this other business thing into it that just supercharges it and brings it profits that no one was looking at before. Right. Or the, or the people that had it before just couldn't execute on it, but that's, you know how to do that. That's often the case. Yeah. Okay. But you know how to do it and do it right and, and how to make money on it, which makes the rest of the property flourish and, and, and all these things. So, so, but I think that's the same, you know, people that we just seen this last few years of people looking at properties that are crappy long-term rentals, but it's an awesome short-term rental, for example, you know, and, <laughs> yeah. and so there's different approaches, I think, to the property. I mean, we had, um, one of the prior webinars, um, you know, and, uh, relationship, a lot of IRAs have invested with here, you know, they were buying a hotel that was a short-term, mm -hmm. uh, kind of like an extended stay type hotel, yep. but they've turned into studio bedrooms that are now apartment buildings, you know? And so those things can be transformative and very profitable. I think, um, it's not just repairing, you know, replacing the countertops and doing it the same thing someone was doing with it before. I mean, there could be ways to make money that way, but what do you think about it? Do you need to do something different in the strategy yeah. of the property? That's my philosophy, you know, and the slides so would have kind of also shown that, but I think it's better to talk about it. You know, our premise uh, up until today's market was we were going to buy things from operators who had given up. And we were going to arbitrage by taking a distressed building, bad bank, uh, bank, you know, records, let's call it bankruptcy. I bought several of my properties out of bankruptcy. And we were going to overlay a new team, a new fit and finish. And we were going to operate it with numerous revenue streams and create a forced appreciation, but on steroids, right? Not just taking it from $1 million EBITDA, but maybe to $4 million EBITDA. Uh, so that's how we were looking at it. But you just you just stole my thunder. I was going to show you a series <laughs> of articles about I call the epicenter of distress assets is probably going to be hospitality. Mm. Uh, what happened during the COVID was lenders left hospitality, mm. and this is part of the strategic yeah. advantage that we're about to share with you. Um, over the last several years, I've become well known in these little markets uh, and with great people. I'm a you know we build a community of investors. So it's all about getting to know the actual operators as the hospitality syndication company or the hospitality guy. And over those years, brokers know that we only really buy things that are below, below replacement value, that have a business problem and need physical repair. Because I don't want to buy an ugly building that's just been updated. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's like, no, I'd rather buy it fully ugly and at full discount. Right. Yeah. When you say uh, below replacement, I just want people to know, like, you couldn't build it cheaper than this. That's been, my, and, but that's the salient thing I want listeners and investors to start thinking about. You know, with inflation over the last few years, without a doubt, it's a little sticky in the world of construction. Yeah. People say the inflation will slow down in construction. But, you know, it raised about 30%. Do we really think it's going to go back down? No. Mm. So if you can buy things, and this has been my argument, I've done six major repositions of resorts and hotels. It's great to start with a beat up old building. A lot of people say I'm crazy. They say, <laughs> no, 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 man, start with dirt. Yeah. Then you can sign a contract, build a building. And I'm always like, yeah, but two things are wrong with buying dirt in my business. You'll never get the land rights that I have. Mm. I'm close to water. Mm. I'm yeah. in a space that you're not allowed to build again. So I, that was my argument for 12 years, right? But what it's done is it's made it's made us saliently focused on the fact that we need to find these the we need to buy below replacement costs. So again, let's talk about generalities to build an apartment building because this is what I want to say. Hotels are going to become. A lot of big box hotels and motels are going to become mm. affordable housing that makes in this sense. next transition. And there's two reasons I argue that's going to happen. One, the industry of hotels took this big hit during the um, the COVID, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, you know, we all thought, oh, it's dangerous because the COVID is going to make nobody travel. Thank God the industry I'm in, which is called Drive to Destination from Manhattan, Drive to from Washington, D.C., Drive to from Philadelphia, we blew up and exploded into success during the COVID. But that's because we were doing what we do well. Now, the typical hotel did suffer. Anything that was based on business travel suffered very bad and still suffers. Mm. It's the vacation hotels that are doing okay. So, one, they did suffer from the COVID, but that's not actually what went wrong. 
the lenders left the market. Mm. So this is an interesting problem. Um, and this is our professor hat. You guys take over if you want. During the housing bubble. It's your opportunity, right? Yeah, I'm here, brother. It's, yeah. I'm here as your guest. During the housing bubble, we all know what happened. Tons of easy money in houses. Houses skyrocketed because everybody could get a mortgage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you take away the mortgage power, it stalls out price increases. Yeah. And if you go to what I'm in, which is hospitality, we've had to we've had to way outperform the market to get debt. So that means the numerous hotels that are underperforming the market have lost most potential to get new debt or to buy debt. So the entire industry just if there was 100 bank lenders that wanted hotels pre COVID, there's 30 that want bank loans now. Wow. It's it's dramatically less. Mm. So you have to be the best operator, which we strive to be in our resort business, or you can convert it to an industry that still has liquidity, and that is multifamily. So two positives could really happen in the world of distressed hotels. And that is if they transition to the affordable housing, they're falling right into a a very high demand business, right? yeah. affordable. So they would charge less per rent per room. They would automatically, you know, of course, there's legal steps and there's a whole bunch of steps. This is yeah. when we get to the business. But if they can get classified as residential housing uh, by zoning, then they will be opened up the door to different types of lenders, yeah. which allows quick arbitrage. You buy it at a fraction of replacement cost because nobody would give you a loan as a hotel. You do do some updates. You do convert it legally to an apartment structure. And then you lease it up as a cost effective option in the market. And then boom, I would expect arbitrage of a 100% price appreciation is possible. Interesting. And because I'm looking, whereas multifamily, we all know is still tricky mm -hmm. to get massive, massive value growth. Yeah. Because you can't, especially now, you probably can't raise rents another 10, 20% like you were able to a year ago. Um, you do have to put a bunch more equity up. Prices are sticky and building costs are still sky high. So mm -hmm. if you want to build a hotel or, or apartment, I'm sure you're $200,000 a key, right? Mm -hmm. That's about what you want to budget. If you and I wanted to go buy some dirt yeah. and build a building, so I'm looking at, just to give you an example, I'm looking at three properties in booming residential markets, but with tired old hotels. Now, the reason these hotels seem cool to me is because some of them I can buy at one third the cost of a, a unit in that market as a rental, right? Yeah. So I'll give you an example. I'm looking at one market outside of Fort Lauderdale, in Fort Lauderdale, believe it or not, a brand yeah. name city like Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, an apartment might go, if you and I were to buy an apartment complex, we'd probably be budgeting about 280,000 a room to buy it, yeah. an apartment. We can probably get into one unit that's beautiful with a one bedroom for about 130,000 wow. a room. Okay. And then all we have to do is arbitrage it to a new function, build the model and create forced appreciation. So I was just in um, San Diego last week for a few days the place where we used to be um, in San Diego, little suburb called Poway, and they had done just that. So it was like by our old neighborhood, I was driving down the street and my wife pointed out and she's like, oh, they turned that into an apartment and storage unit facility. I'm like, looking, it was an old hotel. Mm. It was a rundown hotel. The front end, they renovated, put it into multifam and the back end, put it storage. I was oh. like, huh. So Great I just, idea, by the way. I just saw that and I, and I thought it was brilliant too. It was like, oh, that's cool. It was probably about a hundred units. And then the back, it was, uh, yeah, and, and it was right off the road. And then the back was storage. I was like, well, that was pretty smart. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of an eyesore for the longest time. And then went back and I, I she just pointed out to me. I was like, oh, so it's already happening. It, it is going to happen. And okay, I'll, I can go a little deeper on why this also happens. Uh, for those of you who've never invested in hospitality yet, you, again, you know, people with me make money because we do the wedding thing. So I'm looking at it as arrow up or arrow down. So I'm trying to get every broker. If you're listening and you're a broker, uh, our typical uh, buy market is four buy markets, uh, broadly around Tampa through Fort uh, to, to Jacksonville, okay, so Florida. 
basically from Dallas to San Antonio, so pretty broad markets. And then where we're well known for restaurants and hotels is outside of New York City and outside of Washington, D.C. So those four markets, I'm going to have key staff players and we're going to do a mix because our investor database is so wonderfully rich and strong. You know, we have growing community. We can place partnerships, uh, you know, we can place the money into really attractive returns at hospitality at two ends of the spectrum. When we see a distressed hotel that can become a world-class legacy hotel and go up to $75 million in value someday from 10 million, mm -hmm. which is one of our properties on page to do that, or we go downscale, we get out of hospitality, take a hospitality asset and transition down to a multi, either way, we're gonna get that deal flow. And we're just gonna go arrow up, arrow down or pass. Mm. And I, 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 we're putting together a wonderful team of, uh, of a whole team to exploit this opportunity. And it, it's very attractive. It's awesome. I love it. All right, for those of you that are on, just fire over into your the Q&A box there, any questions, and I'll be cruising through those and I'll Matt and I will continue to tee some up for I got uh, a, Josh. I got a question. because I want to kind of think about this for two different people. I mean, you know, there's people, you know, Josh, I want to learn from you to be like, how do I excel on distressed deals doing them myself? Being I like that. Josh, I you that. <laughs> and I want to learn how to raise money, you know, from other people, and I want to do this. But also, the investor, it's like, hey, how do I understand that opportunity? Feel comfortable to invest? How do I vet a deal or an operator? Um, you know, what are the things you see people doing because they're yeah. vetting you? Like, what? Did, I mean, tell me every day. Let's hit both of those, however way you want to start with. I'm going to break it into active versus passive. And I'm so glad you have Perfect. such a wonderful community of active investors that are going to be able to, they have great, this is what I call human capital. They have the talent, the time, and the wherewithal to be active. Yeah. And they will, and I always say to all of our families who invest with us, our method of passive syndication is powerful and you're going to get double digit yield. That's awesome. Um, but active will earn more. OK, yeah. <laughs> without a doubt, if you can run these deals yourself, you should earn twice or more than what you can earn passively. But you got to do it. Yeah. So here's what I would do if I were and you not screw it up. And you wanted. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And this is 12 years of getting our butts kicked in and then 20 years before that. So if you're active, you want to do this. Let's answer the first question. I'll tell you how to find deals. I'll probably tell you how to underwrite them. And I'll tell you a little bit more about why. My argument is the epicenter of opportunity is going to be around distressed hospitality. Yeah. There's going to be distress in office. There's going to be distress in mismanaged multifamily, but that's going to be a little harder to find. And there'll be uh, hospitality mm -hmm. distress. So if you want to raise money, I always ask you to, to do one thing at first. And that's a mental shift. And this was a mental shift. It took me about four years. Um, and it was five years ago. I went to a few uh, trusted people some of which have probably been on this show. They're well known in the market. And they actually used to come to my old hotels and tell me I should learn how to raise money because I was working for family offices. Mm, yeah. Never had to raise a dollar. Um, but I was, you know, I didn't know how to control a deal or buy a deal at five years ago. Here's the mental shift I would ask your active people to do. As soon as you accept one dollar from another person, I really want you to put the shift on that you just became a private equity shop in the biggest sense, that's the term. In the smallest sense, you now are running a different business. And this is a mental shift I encourage everybody to slowly take. You know, I've all we've all met, I have hundreds of friends that raise money for multifamily and syndications for self storage. They call themselves the multifamily people mm -hmm. or the yeah. self storage people yeah. or me, the hospitality mm -hmm. people. But I always remind them, listen, you're really those people's private equity shop yeah. and you're deploying capital into multifamily. Mm -hmm. And yeah. at some point, you got to respect both are very complicated businesses. Very true. Yeah, it's such a great point. Yeah, because, so, yeah. I Once you took somebody's money and you have all the legal requirements of a K-1, not talking about good boy, bad boy behavior. Yeah. You're, we believe you're going to be ethical. I'm talking about it's just complicated. The level yeah. of lawyers I have, CPAs, third-party reviews, on-time distributions, it's a business right? and it needs to be respected. I mean, that's one of the reasons why people are like, you know, you talk here about some of these like companies that are publicly traded for lack of better and then they go private. Well, why do they want to go back private to have like one owner or one, you know, big 
you know, yeah, like what Michael Dell took, you know, Dell computers public, and then he went all the way back to private because he wanted to focus on making freaking computers mm -hmm. and that's it. He wanted the one business. <laughs> he didn't want to have to be like, I have all these shareholders, all these people with opinions and running that business. And it's kind of the same when you're raising capital. I think you, I think so. You're, you're talking now to like, you've, it does take some work. Um, and, uh, and, and some, and some, and some, and but of course it's an opportunity of ways to raise capital that you couldn't do if you didn't have that, you know, we're not all, we'll, you know, I'm, don't, we're not like some of, you know, these rich families that, you know, here's your $10 million son, you know, I, I will tell you something, <laughs> uh, Matt, it's an honor to be here because what you've done and the team around directed IRA is listen, you're, you're opening people's minds to the fact that IRAs do not have to be trapped in the wall street casino. They yeah. can legally be placed into several different asset types, yeah. anything legally acceptable by the IRS code. That's already a mind bender for people. The second mind bender is that it's so tangible. I don't know if people give it enough credit the first time they realize when they put money in a note, right? Some they buy a note on a building that they know it's extremely tangible. They know where that note went and what yeah. it's on, if it's small, okay. Or what fix and flipper they gave the money to. Then you come up to where we are, where we do projects that are hundreds of acres. Uh, you know, our staff at any one time is between 275 people and 500 people and their money at Accountable Equity, what happened was they put a ton of people to work from bankrupt properties. Yeah. And we pay a living wage and investors start to realize they're one step away from that. They made that possible. Mm -hmm. They're 100,000. So I love all that. So if you're gonna raise money, Mrs. Smith, Mr. Smith, Billy Bob, Jenny Sue. <laughs> all great investors, all strong investors. They're, I and they're active. not leaving out Billy Bob and Jenny Sue. That was good. I love those two. <laughs> Uh, the please best. recognize you've created you've created a new company. It needs its own mission and purpose because you're going to have to treat it as a company. And that's why we don't call our company the same thing we call the hotels. We call it accountable equity. Yeah. Um, number two, you can raise money slowly. One good relationship at a time, I believe, is probably the right way for most of us listening to this today. And that's what we've been investing in hundreds of times where we put ourselves out there and in, the, in the, my advice to any of those who are going to become syndicators in any way, let people hear how you think, believe your ethics and values and what your strategy is, right? And just pers don't even have to persuade. You're basically repelling the people that hate you already mm -hmm. and should not call you. Right. And you're attracting the people into your life that understand your fe feelings and philosophy on life. And they're the ones who are going to enjoy investing with you. Um, okay. So All right, that's active. Okay. That's active. Now let's talk about self-directed IRA mm -hmm. investors, yep. some of their personal funds. And they're yep. like, okay, I, I like the opportunity here. Tell me like, how, how do I find these opportunities? How do I get comfortable with it? How do I vet an operator? Okay. So first thing I think that is phenomenal is what you do. Uh, and this is an outgrowth of a lot of media that you do from podcasts and whatever. So IRA group, directed IRA, just in, invites conversations, right? That's all this is, it's a conversation. Use these conversations to pick up one new determining factor that you want in an operator, right? Or an allocator of your capital. Uh, realize, okay, I really like somebody who's great at analytics and that person who was on sounded incredibly good at analytics, that attracts me. Or maybe you find somebody who's on one of these, that, that's an active person like us, and you, you really uh, attracted to their, their belief in the structure uh, uh, the dignity of people, which is our whole business is based on treating people with uh, infinite dignity. So we're really focused on operations. We're operators at heart. And then other people are really good at placing money and pulling it back out all the time. And that's not us, right? There's different types of people, yeah. you know, the house flipper guy. We're not the house flipper guy. We're building mega cash flows. Um, you find what you like, then you dig in. And this is another, uh, you dig in on other webinars or, you know, reading about them or yeah. uh, that's why you and I do podcasts, right? We, we want yeah. we want to attract. OK, so vetting. I think the other vetting is uh, getting to know other investors. Mm -hmm. And um, it's great if you can find an active leader, a sponsor, a group like ours or any of those where they actually make themselves super available in. We do it through methods. I'm sure other people do it other ways we do 
uh, four, three, three group events a year, uh, break bread with our whole team. Okay. So there are a lot of other people that try that do what we try to do. Okay. So that's one really good way. I encourage investors that call me out of the blue, just heard of the concept. Uh, they have 50 grand burning a hole in their IRA. They don't want to be in wall street. I always encourage them to be, be at peace. We're always going to be here. Ask me some tough questions and take some time. If you're ready to invest, we're ready. If, if you're not, take your time, you know, because it is a change. Whatever you thought you were doing in Wall Street, uh, you know, okay, that feels kind of cold and button pushing. But once you put money in capital groups like us, the positive and the negative is, you know us. Mm. The, negative is, <laughs> you you, know. the negative is, you know us. <laughs> All right. The negative is, and this is the biggest thing anybody in the directed IRA space needs to remember. We're not liquid, right? The money went into dirt yeah. Yeah. and a building yeah. <laughs> and a business plan. And if the business plan says three to five years, it probably actually means three to five years. So it's a little tricky to pull it back out. So, you, mm -hmm. so back to the first principle, you're investing in the people that run that, mm -hmm. that project more than the project specs anyway those are my that's my little soapbox ask me any questions what, you what want is typically you 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 gave that fifty thousand dollar number and that's a, a question that we get a lot and we've done previous webinars like you know how people can use a, a small balance or you know lower balance ira you know what kind of things can they invest in what what is typically you find um what are your minimums and what do you see people you know, most successful. Thank you. Um, doing like, what does that look like for the investors out there? Well, you know, uh, I hope this is always our philosophy, but our theory in life has been um, keep the minimums down. Um, and mm. the, the reason is, is because we believe we're building a track record for a person or a family. So we have small note funds where we let you place capital right into our projects, collateralized at as little as ten thousand dollars okay and it it yields right away and there is liquidity on those and you can get it up to ten percent but if you're investing smaller amounts it is less and we do it we 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 appreciate larger investments so we offer higher preferences okay but we want people to dabble right because even if you dabble with ten thousand you're going to see how gro how our communication works you'll get to know us and then you might feel comfortable higher amounts obviously the average for us is about seventy five thousand okay. so we're not we're not heavy weighted towards 10 grand. Uh, there's only one of our assets you're allowed to do that in. The rest are around 50. That's a unique approach. I like that. That's yeah. like a good, that's a different approach than probably what we've talked about with other people in the past on how they approach that and look at that. So that's good. Yeah. It's, based, it's that. based on this word community because, you know, what we think we're creating, similar to Directed IRA and all the work we do, we think we're just going to pour ourselves into our community, let, let our projects mature, and in the meantime, bring good people. Uh, we do keynote speakers. I'd love to have you guys come out yeah, and yeah. speak to our Matt will community. do that. Yeah, it's a little trip for you, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. He'll make, he'll make the trip. I'll carry his bags. Yeah, <laughs> I'll do it for you, Josh. I'll do it. Um, well, what about? Um, let me hit the strategy and and because I yeah, think let's do it. This is important for when. Is if I'm an investor and I'm looking at private investments, you know, I've talked about it. I've mentioned it before, you know, buying a stock or mutual fund. I feel like, you know, you're you're like in the grocery store or you're at the mall and it's like everything's on the rack and if the price is what it is and it's the same price at the next store and like, you know, and it and 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 it's just what it is is what it is, you know, but like in alternative <laughs> assets, it's like, well, what is the value of this? And there's so many nuanced to it and can i trust this person and and what's the strategy that they have but so i think for me looking at alternative assets this is just matt Sorensen for my own account and um i think as a, as a lawyer too is i'm like i want to know the operator themselves what is their track record you know you, you can roll the dice on someone doing their very first deal sure maybe you know but like i wouldn't throw a lot of money at that mm -hmm. um so look at track record the best indication of how they're going to do on the next deal is how they do on their last ones um but also the really dig into the strategy and this is why i thought josh from what you've talked about this opportunity in hospitality is so strong for what you're doing because not only are you making a pretty good argument to me in terms of the the opportunity there 
is you know what you're doing in that space. Right. You know what I mean? You, it, it's one thing to have a good idea. It's another thing to execute on mm -hmm. it. And that's like, even you here today, you're giving people the idea. Some people are like, this guy's crazy. He's telling people everybody's doing. Mm -hmm. what is he, everybody's just going to listen and just try and go what you're doing. You got to be able to execute on it. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about that? I think I think those are, and Aaron, any comments you guys have, but I just want to kind of summarize some of my thoughts about anybody with their IRA account, analyze the, the, the person you're investing in mm -hmm. and the opportunity, but the strategy of what they're doing and, and understand how they're proposing you're gonna make money on this. I'm, I'm happy to opine on this. And if I go uh, a different path, just push me up and say, oh, go back to a different topic. Um, <laughs> I heard you say it all starts with the team, the sponsor team. Yeah. And, you know, I'm agreeing with you. And, you know, it's funny. My wife and I have done this together for years. Um, and one of the things is we're very honored to have this large investor community. 3,000 plus people in the list. Nice. 350 or so have written checks. So the rest are hopefully eventually going to involve themselves. And we really see it as like a, uh, we call it a community, investor community. So, you know, we always bring special keynotes in mm. and we gather and break bread at least three times a year, one of the properties. Okay. Yeah. And our whole theory is at the tables, I try to spread out our team, yeah. the decision making team. And the theory is, Slowly but surely, more and more of the investors themselves will know the actual operators. What we always say from the, the stage is, we're going to share with you our track record. We're going to share with you our decisions, why we made those choices. You, we're not going to be flawless. But, you know, I think a lot of people fell in love with our group during the COVID. We had raised $11 million and we were turning around a dump that first property, I should show you the after pictures later. Mm -hmm. We were turning it around. Actually, if you don't mind, I'll show it. Yeah, to yeah you. let's throw that up there. Because <laughs> yeah. I do have some uh, questions that came in on asset classes and cap rates and stuff. So we'll hit on that in a minute. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? Um, and for some reason, I closed it. I don't know why that's not working. Anyway, while I try to figure that one out, give me a second. Sure. Yeah. Um, the COVID starts. We finally get the building turned around physically. Mm -hmm. We have a whole book of business for weddings sold in advance. And the COVID starts five weeks after we finished the last ballroom construction project. Yikes. So oh. February, March, uh, 2020. And I think everybody, I had one investor now who will admit, I thought I just lost a hundred grand, right? <laughs> I mean, all hell yeah. broke loose. We ended up doing something. Um, we had spent four years living in Europe, my beautiful wife and I, when we were young. And we, we were exposed to these winter villages. Remember, yeah. one in the Northeast. I love that London so has one in like Christmas or whatever. It's mm. amazing. Yeah, that's what we're famous for on the East Coast too. So during the COVID, we quickly built an outdoor village. We brought in an NHL hockey rink. We brought in vendors and musicians. And we're playing in the 30 degree temperatures outside with space heaters and fire pits. And it exploded. We made it in the Wall Street Journal during the COVID. We... We exploded. We went from a bankrupt, dangerous business mm -hmm. to on the cover on a portion of the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, so to pivot. That was a great pivot. We had to pivot. And did we always succeed at that? No. We we decided uh, we built a few more parts of the village that didn't make money, but the other parts made millions of dollars. We're like, whoa. And more than that, we became famous. You know, quote unquote, the property is now well known. Mm -hmm. They went from a bankrupt, forgotten property to a well known regional resort, and all of that was just because of the pivot. Now. Thank God it worked out. But the point wasn't whether it worked out and whether we're smart or, or we came up with a cool idea. The part was, is we attacked it. And I think that's why our investor base at that time was 115. It's now 350. Even though we're in hospitality during inflation, during all these terrible things over the last four years, investors continue to join us. Now, I think they're going to fall in love with us using our deal flow to keep doing a few special resorts and to keep going down to multifamily. I think we're in the right mm -hmm. spot. Oh, okay. But um, the person and their decision making, I think, is back to your point. Strategy. Let's talk about the strategy of what we're talking about today. Let me break it down one more second. It's We start with the idea of can we build this again all in? So if we buy something, let's assume like we can find a few of these properties that in that market, it would cost 250 to 280 by a shell of a, a rental building, like each room. And we're buying it 130 and we're gonna spend 30 on it. We're 160 in. Now we know 
once we turn it into a successful hotel uh, apartment building, we have a really strong basis compared to the next door neighbor. Mm -hmm. That gives us real strategic opportunity to be a low cost provider. Not that I ever love being a low cost provider. I always like being a value provider, but mm -hmm. it's nice to know you can be the lowest yeah. cost and still make more than the next guy. Yeah. <laughs> and in a downward going economy, damn, that'll be a strength, right? That's a key yeah. strength where we build into our model. We do that now with our resorts. Like our resorts, the scale of our resorts, you know, some of them are gonna do 25 million in a year. Nice. They went from doing 2 million a year to 25 million a year in three years. That's world-class numbers for most inland resorts. We're not talking about on Malibu Beach here. Yeah. We're talking a place in the middle of the woods. That's a world-class revenue number. Um, but we bought it and built it for about a third of what it would cost to build a hotel that can do 25 million a year. And I just love that. Mm -hmm. Our investors feel safe. So strategy, we're gonna be focused on going in basis low. In this scenario, this strategy, we're gonna go into being able to make money as the lowest cost provider in the market. And then uh, we are gonna keep arbit uh, another arbitrage option. And that is because we run, I, I think right now we have uh, nine restaurants, 14 corporate meeting rooms, fifth, you know, five beautiful resort wedding venues. We, we, we operate a lot of high cash flow things. We could use portions of these buildings to overlay a different model mm -hmm. on what I call free real estate. So if we buy the building and we get restaurants and ballrooms, we can either do what you said, which was always awesome, turn some of them into self-storage. Yeah. <laughs> right? That's a whole nother arbitrage that's not even in the factory, right? Mm -hmm. But I Did call I just that give free you that real idea? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my buddy gave me WeWork, which of course is not as my as not as powerful as storage. I think storage is awesome. Uh, <laughs> But it's free real estate, right? Because when you and I talk about that that strategy, let's go back to Billy Bob and Jenny Sue. Mm. If you guys want to go out and buy a building, you're typically going to talk about it in terms of the keys. Mm -hmm. But with hospitality, you're going to get another 40,000 square feet of free building. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do with it? And that's what we think we can really supercharge returns for investors. We'll go over there, be a low-cost provider. The whole building and business plan will be paid for with the rooms. And anything we do with the extra is actually additional double digit gravy. Mm -hmm. uh, and then capacity. You said that earlier. Yeah. One of the things we may have done right or we may have done wrong, it depends your opinion. We've always hired great leaders. Now, we did it early and often. My wife and I barely take a, 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 a withdrawal because our goal isn't to get to build immediate cash flow for us as a family, it's to build a business. And so we have wonderful finance department, wonderful, uh, you know, uh, investor team, underwriting team, and they're actually paid well. We're not talking a bunch of, about a bunch of dudes that I can call on a cell phone and I pretend that they're on my team. Yeah, I'm talking about like real people that work with us side by using side, using their track record. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My point, my point is, I think that's the capacity you're talking about. Yeah, it's not just a dude making a phone call to buy a motel, which is what maybe somebody listening to do today. By the way, if you're super tenacious, you can make that work, Billy Bob yeah, or Jenny Sue. You can make that work, but we can make it work repeatedly. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I think on the, I'll say too, on the strategy, like their investment approach is, you know, and I saw this more as an attorney, people would bring me some private placement they wanted me to review. And I'm like, okay, I'm like, how are they making money? I'm mean, like, I'm reading some offering memorandum and some executive summary. And I'm like, what are they doing to make money? They're like, well, we're going to buy it. And then, and then what? And then we're going to sell it for more later. And I'm like, why? <laughs> like, oh, like, yeah, like, that's a good it's like, point. It's like, what are you doing to sell it? That's going to make more. Well, we're going to get, we're going to raise the rents. Okay. So like, so I think as an investor, you should be asking like, how does this make money? And if right. you don't understand their explanation, don't invest. Like you got a perfect, perfect it. answer. Yeah. Perfect answer. And you're right. You're right. Because because my original background was always operator. I was actually the construction manager uh, for ultra luxury five to $20 million houses. Then I became, uh, uh, I built the resort business with a partner 20 year, 12 years ago. And from that day forward, I've been a deep, deep operator with staff and, and yeah. leadership teams and goals and rocks and milestones and achievement. So we always think about the business plan that goes into the building, right? Mm -hmm. Real estate for us is the 
the safety net, the collateral, uh, sure. the way you're going to create a ton of wealth. But the business you put in it, um, yeah. what I love is I call it levers. How many levers can we pull to create NOI? Mm -hmm. And rooms is always, in my opinion, always just one lever. Mm -hmm. And it's the key lever. It's mm -hmm. the most important. It's the biggest one. But every other one you can touch because of operational prowess, uh, the more profit you can throw off to the investors. Love it. Right, we Should we do a rapid fire? Yeah, let's, let's do, do a little Q rapid &A. fire Q and A. Um, let's see. Let me hit this one. Um, is each property uh, in your portfolio treated as a separate investment, uh, or is there a fund that invests in multiple properties? And what is the typical IRR and periodic dividend payout? Great question. So we have designed, and I don't have that slideshow, but Oops. you know what? I'll show you this while we're doing it. Cool. Uh, the The answer is we again. Hmm, one quick second. You, it's your choice. We have multiple ways to invest with us okay. intentionally, because not everybody's cut from the same cloth. So we have a whole group of funds. We call them Capital H funds, where we're building legacy assets for cash flow. You're not getting immediate jumps in capital. You're getting long-term payments and refinance structure. Those, you get a preference point, a very high preference. You can, it can be postponed a year while we're under construction, but I don't think I've ever missed it, right? It's always been on time once a year. Those are long-term wealth builders, and then I'm seeking to refinance and give you your capital back. And we're planning on holding those. That's another special thing. And we let investors stay our partners forever, right? We don't buy them out. It's, it's, it's not necessarily a, a pref and then you get out. So that's one type of investment with us. Uh, we also have a debt fund where you can get in and out, okay, and very liquid uh, in that sense. And then we have a leasing company, not good for IRAs. I was talking to you about this on your other show, Matt. Mm -hmm. We own a leasing company because it's the most impressive strategy for high cash flow monthly and super tax depreciation. And we let that be for the W-2 per not the W-2 person, the person with other passive assets that doesn't want to pay tax. They constantly use their passive loss to offset passive income. Really cool. So we have all three things. And uh, we don't typically do one property per fund anymore. Okay. What we do is like small funds, basically multi-property syndications. And we tell you, we usually seed a fund with a property. Like we are buying this one big target and we're going to find uh, complementary targets. We're going to set the fund as a $50 million raise, but we're only going to take it in in tranches and we'll get the project done. Then we'll open it up again and you'll end up with a portfolio. But go ahead and hit me with other questions. I will pull up some really cool before and afters. What is What are your thoughts? This comes from Dennis about converting some of the hotels, some of these distressed hotels to short term rental units. Yeah. Couldn't be better uh, when it's right. Now, there's a nuance here. Let's use a simple uh, assumption. One of the properties we're looking at is 200 apartments. Okay. Uh, they're, they're actual suites. So they're built as a suite hotel, but they get kitchenettes, they get a living yep. room, and they get a bedroom. So it's going to be a nice little efficient flip into an apartment. I believe the key for me is leverage, right? So we're going to want affordable leverage. So we got to get it out of the uh, transient status with bank loans for, for hotel loans, and we got to get it over to multifamily. So there is a person that I work with, a real strategist. There's a nuance there. You don't want to do like, even if you could rent 50% of them out in short term, you may not want to, op that may not be optimal for debt structure. Mm -hmm. And the debt structure is where the families who invested are going to probably get their biggest IRR, right? Whether it be a refi, get your money back or cheap debt for higher cash flow. So we're going to strike a balance in our model where we're going to make sure we solidly fit within the criteria of Fannie Freddie. And then whatever we're allowed to do short term, we will, and we'll do bet. We'll probably do it better than all the other short term people because this is our business, and we drive about three times the average daily rate than our competitors at our hotels. So I'm sure we can do a great job on Airbnb with the rooms we're allowed to do that. Does that kind of make sense? Yep. Now we're famous for major construction, by the way. So construction, we own a, a very robust construction company, and we do true like repositions right now. There's some nice and, before uh, and afters. Yeah, yeah. Like legit, legit construction, yeah. real transformation. Yes, we need to host an event there, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> oh, definitely, guys. I will set you up like crazy. You will love it. We do need to but do keep a, going. out on the East Coast. Yeah. We need, we, we're we always making them come out here. That'd be a cool venue too. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, it would be a treat. And, and we're really close to New York. Our 
average bride is Manhattan, even though we're in New Jersey. Yeah. And not far from DC. We're going to check out the Winter Village. <laughs> yeah. Matt's going to ice pictures. skate. He's going to figure skate for us. I can't wait. Yeah. You know, my, my family actually makes fun of me because I, um, I like to, I like to go to the, you know, this, the holiday, the Christmas, you know, with the village and do the little ice skating, you know, and um, I get all like, I don't know, I just, I get a little proud out there. Yeah. I'm not a great skater, but you know, I like to get out and, you know, just, <laughs> I don't know why. That's it's a good, that's a good that one moment in my t life when I do that is like, not what I'm necessarily good at. But I just like, I just like getting out there and you ever see the show blades of glory. <laughs> Yeah, Will I'm, Ferrell, uh, Chaz, Will, Chaz Michael Will, Michaels. <laughs> yes, dude, what was that? Uh, the blade, that one kick that kills people, cuts their heads off. Oh, uh, yeah. what is... <laughs> I forget the name. I don't know. I don't I know was... that it was a kick. It had a name. Don't do it. Don't yes, do it. Don't, don't do the move. Yeah, it's awesome. Anyways, sorry guys. So this don't is get... our winter village. I'll, I'll show you a little bit Beautiful. around, uh, uh, and uh, I'll play the video for those who are watching. You'll be, you'll blow, it'll blow your mind. But keep going. Hit me with tough questions. Folks. Are you doing anything in the assisted living or memory care stuff? Like, what are your God bless you for asking? What are your thoughts on um, that? You know, it, it's going to take me 30 seconds, but our Go whole purpose in life was to create something called Viva May Culture. Now, Viva May Culture is something I've been part of for 12 years. It's the concept that service delivered with intentionality to treat someone so they know they are loved. It's a very human dignity kind of service we create, we foster. It has a vertical stack of, of places we want to place this structure. So Viva May Hospitality is our day-to-day -day hospitality management company. Okay. It's also the engine that has all the great executive staff, uh, anywhere from seven executive chefs at any time. And we have chefs, we have construction operators. It's a mega engine of operators. And it's built on three virtues, joy of service, humility as a strength, we seek humility, and ministry as our purpose. And ministry is bigger than just like a religious concept of ministry. It's the primordial sense that when you deliver a service for the intention of showing the other person genuine care and love, it has a soulful impact. That type of hospitality management, which is what we're famous for, definitely will eventually lend itself to memory care, but I don't see that in the next five years. For right now, we're going to solidly do, um, and I've been investigating that for four years, but for right now, we do it sequentially. We're very good at these highly activated experiential resorts. We'll never stop that. I've looked at ranches, hundreds and hundreds of acres of ranches in Austin. Mm -hmm. um, I had three under contract at one point. And these places where I can do mega weddings, land bank, hundreds of acres and build, and build houses. That's kind of like our core business. Um, using our prowess and our expertise in, in hospitality to buy these conversions to multifamily is, is just a very straightforward next step mm -hmm. of adding asset classes to our investor community. But there you go. That's what it looks like, Matt. Love it. It's beautiful. That's cool. Um, so just to kind of um, recap, as far as your focus, taking that distressed hospitality, converting it into affordable housing, multifamily, as you seeing, um, you know, a great strategy and play there, maybe adding in some self storage. W having said that, what are you seeing as like the highest returns or, you know, best cap rates? I've had several people ask that okay, kind of out question. of those three asset classes. Um, I think you're, when you said self storage, you mean as a tangential asset in the building, correct? Yeah. I'm not oh, going to probably be building. Prop. Yeah. You're probably not converting the whole thing to no. that. That just wouldn't make sense. Right. Yeah. So what I will do, and this has been the case with all of our properties, like all of the properties you saw all came with mega land development potential. And I always okay. great news. That's a great news story. I call it. Yeah. It ain't happening in your pro forma. It's not even in the pro forma. Same thing will be the case for all those extra square footage. Remember we were talking yep. about, so anything we do with self storage probably won't even be in the pro forma. Anything we do with other rentals won't be in the pro forma, just the rooms. It'll all be gravy and it'll be owned by the investors. It's not like partitioned out. We don't do anything nefarious or weird. We, everybody owns the whole project. Okay. Um, a few people have gone to your website. They're looking at, you know, some of the debt opportunities around six to 10% uh, preferred return with liquidity. Um, you mentioned you have some other 
uh, projects with, you know, double digit type returns? Like what, what are those projects look like? Well, by the way, is your audience like this good? They've already they, done research. Yeah, they're on it. Hey, <laughs> they, these, are, these are active investors, doers. These aren't like, I mean, I'd say probably so, maybe 20% or maybe new-ish. Checking out, but they're, so Matt, they're researching live. Yeah. Yeah. So when Matt invited me to do this show, I said, absolutely, we'll do this. <laughs> But I kind of pictured it'd be a month from now because yeah. by the March first, yeah, we will be launching three new equity funds, which will probably blow people's minds. It'll be like fifteen minute, fifteen IRR to twenty IRR, based on this conversion strategy. What you're seeing today is my every day of the year. You could put a little bit of money in our our um, um, our debt fund. Now, our debt fund is clearly not the lowest end of that preference. Is for the people that want to be able to get in and out and sure. sit there. Clearly, when I set it up six months ago, that was a pretty good number. Now it's getting tight because of all the inflation of, of rates. <clears throat> Our equity funds usually start between 8 to 10% PREF and full distributions forever. You know, you get your PREF back after you get your capital back. Then we go to participation splits forever. Mm -hmm. So they're very high. They're usually, they tend to model in the 20% IRR, and I usually back them down and offer them at the 15% IRR. And that's just because of arbitrage. We're not your plain vanilla investor that just does the old, we'll raise the rent strategy. Right, a little value add here. We transform the rent. Yeah. We transform the rent. Love, Love it. it. Do you have some good... <laughs> we just, I, was like, I was like, there we go, I'm going to harmonize that a little bit. <laughs> well, you know, we got some good voices going on here. Um, what books, resources do you have yeah. for, for the listeners and those that are, that are tuning in today on, you know, managing private equity, yeah. being good operators? What are some of your best hits out there that you could recommend to people? Yeah. Two, well, two things. One, I thought you were going to ask, what can you get from us right this second? I believe that we have too. Two you do that too. You, you two do that downloads, too. Two downloads. Two uh, downloads. You can grab, you can grab my wife and I wrote a book, the 10 steps to resort Perfect. rehab riches. Uh, and that was written pre pandemic, but uh, you'll see the premise of why our we succeeded during the pandemic. We're on pace to grow EBITDA 100% during this year because our model does pre-sell the building. So we're sold out. It's hard to get a room in this for about a year. So the other things that I think guide our philosophy are uh, structured business books. And the reason I say that is because we see the placement of capital, which is what I think you were asking me yep. how to run a great capital allocation company. Yep. We do see that as one of the key functions of running great businesses. So for me, it all began 12, 15 years ago when I started building companies for a private office, a family office. I built many companies and I read the E-Myth a hundred, like the half a dozen times. Oh, Michael Gerber's E-Myth. Yep. Michael Gerber yep. helped me get my head straight. Love it. He's then, a great man. And if, since then, I've probably read everything from Patrick Lencioni. I hope okay. that's on my podcast about the strength in organizational health. And we're not flawless. We're not perfect. But we drive to maximize that personal human capital in our company. So we're a big Patrick Lencioni people. And if you want to understand the way we do business, that would be a good read. And then, of course, um, EOS. But we don't use the EOS. We use a version of it uh, mm -hmm. where you really keep track of milestones and you you run a proper company with proper scheduled uh, deliverables. Love it. We're going through scaling up by the Gazelle's yep, company. that's a great one. Internally. So that's yeah. what we're doing yeah. internally. Um, uh, let, let's sit on this and then we'll just kind of wrap it up. Um, what do you see as opportunities out there with a lot of other commercial type buildings? Like, you know, you have uh, like City Corp as an example that somebody put in here, but you got these office complexes that have just been empty for three years. They're going to stay empty. You know, some of them have guaranteed leases on them. Probably a lot of them do. They might have a childcare facility attached to it because that's what a lot of those type, you know, so they already have infrastructure. Do you see an opportunity there for like um, turning those into affordable housing or do you not think it, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? What do you see as an opportunity? I've watched it. I've watched it. Um, the last conference I spoke at was uh, the Richard Wilson's family office. Oh, uh, yes. Conference. Yeah. He's, okay. a, he's an a, he's actual investor in some of our, not only investor, he's a partner on two of our funds. Mm -hmm. And uh, he and I collaborate on a lot of projects. So he, um, one of the panelists we got to serve with was a person who was sharing with all about the fact that, uh, you know, this was a luxury conversion, but they converted a whole office building into a luxury re resort, okay. uh, a hotel. 
I was surprised by that. It was the first time I've ever been open to it. So no, do I know much about the conversion of offices to, to uh, any kind of residential? I don't. I will tell you self-evidently, it's it's going to be a very costly conversion. Sure. It's self-evident yeah. because you don't have the common infrastructure. So when we're looking at in contrast, when we're looking at a, we're looking at extended stays to affordable housing, we're looking at suites, mega suites that used to be embassy suites, hotels, which are mm. kind of nice properties, right? Uh, they've kind of run their life span. Yeah. I wanted to say one other reason that your investors may not realize this, but they'll know it intuitively because we all travel. Hotels have a five-year mandatory reinvestment if you want to keep the brand Marriott Hilton. Oh yeah, to keep it. the flag. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Mm. During the COVID. They got tons of extensions. They're all coming due. Ooh. And they're coming due during a time when there's no lending money, yeah. deep lending money to help them. So there's going to be buildings that are just functionally obsolete and don't want to do that mega PIP. They call yeah. it a PIP, a property improvement. And that's where the distress is going to happen. Interesting. They may not be terrible buildings. They're just not new Marriott standard. Yeah. So it, it may not be dumps over the next few years. Yeah. And we're gonna be damn straight right in the middle of all the brokers showing us the deals. That's awesome. nice. I mean, they're gonna be just a little more motivated to sell now than they might that's otherwise nice. be. There's a little reason now, ooh, do I wanna dump this more money in or can I get it? Yeah. Maybe it's time to sell. And it's ungodly amounts of money too. It's not just like a few grand a room. It can be upwards yeah. of 30,000 a room. And and their, their complaint when you're a branded hotel operator is I don't think I'll get that money back but I have to do it to keep the Marriott flag. So yeah, the pressure is coming. Yeah, I love it. Um, well, Josh, you also have your podcast. Did you drop that oh, with direct, you know, yeah. you want to drop your podcast or any ways people get in touch with you, um, websites, thank you. anything you want to give there. Yeah, tell it to us for those listening in. And then if you got a yep. slide there, pop that up too. It's funny, as soon as you say it, I'm having a hard time getting to it. But <laughs> Yeah, it's we'll called. have a replay of everything. So for those of you that <laughs> well, you got you know, accountableequity.com, right? You got capital accountable hacking. equity and capital hacking. So capital hacking is a fun uh, where we talk about the dynamic nature of human capital and financial capital and how they come together to create wealth. And that's pretty much we go through the strategies and techniques that we've seen work in hundreds of other companies. And we introduce a lot of people to self-directed IRA models mm -hmm. and directed IRA has been on there multiple times because of our uh, affection for that kind of strategy and the idea of unlocking Wall Street. So capital hacking, easy listening, a lot of fun. You, Matt was just on. Uh, go ahead and hit a QR code on the screen. And then, of course, accountableequity.com. The easiest thing is it's a no threat. Just put your name on the, the, the uh, request info. Because in about three weeks, we'll open up those funds we've been teasing today. You're the first time I've ever talked about this publicly, Matt. Okay. So again, I thought you would, I thought this would be a three. A you're few hearing weeks. it first. <laughs> you heard it first. <laughs> you know, you're going to get the uh, directed IRA bump, you know. Mm -hmm. So everybody comes on the show introducing big news. They get the directed IRA podcast and webinar bump. Well, it's a pleasure. I can't wait to be more involved. Um, I'm a big fan of what you do, and we can't wait to introduce you guys to more of our listeners as well. Yeah, appreciate Thank it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate it. This is going to be recorded, guys, remember. So if you miss any parts or you want to go back and see it, just get over to directiary.com slash webinar. We'll also, Josh, if you don't mind sharing those slides, we'll throw them in. Yep. On yeah. the site with it, just get all that detail that you were sharing there. And then Absolutely. Um, let me just share this slide on our end. Um, cause we do got a promo, you know, for any of you that don't have accounts at directed IRA, we're going to give you 50 Now's the bucks time. Off. Now's the time. Now better than ever. You webinar 50, I'll save you 50 bucks on opening up your new account at directedira.com. And some of our team there, you can see, um, Ryan, Jay, Solana, some of them may have been on in the, in the Q and a there, um, answering some of your questions, but you can get an appointment with any of those. I mean, those three right there, there's, a, there's a lot more, but just on that slide, they're all amazing. So. Um, get on over there to schedule an appointment if you want questions on setting up an account or any help. And we're going to be back actually in a couple weeks. We're talking oh, about yeah. doing two webinars a month now. Yeah, We're um, stepping up our game here at Directed IRA. You yeah, know. we're not just doing once a month. We're going to go two, we're going two for a it. month. Um, so we're going to weave in some client experiences, um, stories from clients that have been successful in self-directing so you can learn from them and what they're doing. So stay tuned for those. And a few you want, open forums. Yeah, we got more open forums coming, answering some questions. We're doing lives. We're just, we're going to be coming at you whether you like it or not. You know, there'll be opportunities to get information. And coming in hot. Yeah, to get any info, make sure you're signed up for the newsletter, which you can do at directedira.com. And we'll see you back the next podcast, webinar, live, whatever it may be. And until then, stay calm, self-direct on. Roth and roll.
Roth and Roth. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. All right.